chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me. calling us out of that grave, Lord, and that we can run to you for everything we need, Lord Jesus. Just be with us here this morning. We just want to keep on glorifying your holy name, Lord. Amen. All right. Let's keep on going.
we're turning over those battles to you right now, Lord, for you to fight for us, Lord. Thank you that you do that for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen. You can be seated for a little bit. After our message today, we'll continue with our worship during our response time. But I'd just like to welcome you all today to Silver Creek Fellowship. If you're here live, which all of you in front of me are, but we also have a large group online with us live right now watching. Uh, I just love whether they're in Lake Halavasu or in Arizona or in Florida, uh, friends and family gathered all around the country, we're able to be together. And I just love uh, when the church gathers, there's the power of God with his people. And it's just so good to be gathered with you all today. Um, This would be a great time if you're here in person or watching online for you to fill out your connection card. You can make sure to include your prayer requests and your answers to prayer there on the back. This is also a great time if you want to prepare. If you came today and want to give, you can do that in person in the bins that are there in the back. Uh, If you're online, you can just click the button that we have there available for you as well. And we have lots of ways at Silver Creek that you can participate with us in giving through our app and through lots of other avenues. If you need help with any of that, just stop by the info desk. We'd be happy to share with you and help you get all of that figured out. Now, in your bulletin, you'll notice there's several announcements. There's things on our calendar, things coming up like the Lent Soup Supper, Um, information about baptisms, information about family camp that's coming, but I'm not going to read those to you out loud because you can read them in the bulletin for yourselves. You can also go to the app. You can also go on our website and find lots and lots and lots of information. And today, I've got a lot of ground to try to cover here, so we're going to jump right into our sermon today, continuing in the story And today, where we left off last week, God's nation is now living in Egypt because, now, this is is excellent story. So you ready? A global famine drove the family because, well, actually, the family sold one of their brothers into slavery. Actually, they faked his death and ultimately sold him into slavery, where he was picked up by a nomadic band of traders who carried him and sold him to a family, a wealthy family in Egypt, where God blessed Joseph, and he actually became the leader of the whole household of Potiphar only then to have Potiphar's wife make a play at him, only for him to reject her, only for her to say he raped her, only for him to get thrown in prison, only for God to be with him and him to rise through the ranks of the prison to become in charge of the prison system, only for eventually Pharaoh to send for him to interpret his dreams, only for Pharaoh then, because God was with him, to make him the administrator second in control of the entire nation of Egypt. So it's just a roundabout story, but he's now second in control of Egypt, and God sends now, not only does he provide for and protect Egypt from famine, but the local nations that surround them, including his family. Yes, the very same family that sold him into slavery at the beginning of the story. So after they come and there's a period of reconciliation and some family healing, God uses Joseph to provide for his family a new home. That's where we'll pick up, Genesis chapter 47, verse 11 and 12. It says, so Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land, the district of Ramesses, as Pharaoh directed. Joseph also provided for his father and his brothers and all of his father's households with food according to their number of children. Okay, so now God's people are living in Egypt in the best part of the land. If you notice, it even says the land of Ramesses. These guys are going to be the pharaohs of Egypt, and now they're living in the very same neighborhood as the king. And even given jobs, Pharaoh gives them not only a land, but he gives them a new responsibility. They're given the job of keeping the flocks, of shepherding the flocks, of Pharaoh himself. So you could say during this period, friends, life is really good for the people of God and for the family of God. And that is where the book of Genesis comes to an end. That's the closing verses of the book of Genesis. You have this family now living in Egypt and life is looking good. And then some time passes. And as you open up the book of Exodus, you're going to see this startling thing take place. New pharaohs have come and gone, 
And now a pharaoh has taken over control that doesn't know his own national history. He doesn't know the stories of Joseph. He doesn't know that Joseph led uh, the Egyptian people to their time of prosperity. He doesn't know that Joseph is the one who actually purchased all of the land of Egypt from the Egyptians and gave it to Pharaoh and the whole system of taxes. Uh, you can thank Joseph for that, by the way. The whole system of taxes, they owed one-fifth of all of their wealth and possessions to Pharaoh for the right to be on Pharaoh's land. That came from Joseph. All this wealth, all this family time, all this greatness, and Pharaoh doesn't remember where it came from. And so it says this in Exodus 1, 6 through 14. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in number, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. So now this new Pharaoh is so intimidated by the size, the strength, and the blessing of the Hebrew people that he does the unthinkable. He goes from let's enslave them to Exodus 1 verse 22. And Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born must be thrown into the Nile, but let every girl live. God's people are going to live through this kind of unbelievable cruelty as slaves of their masters, the Egyptians. And they're going to live in this state for 400 years. Now, let me ask you a question. Had God forgotten about his people? Had he fallen asleep at the wheel? Did these 400 years of captivity take God by surprise? No, actually, God had revealed exactly this would happen to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verse 12 through 14. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. God had actually told them this is exactly what was going to happen. But here's an important theme that we learned last week if you were here for the story of Joseph. Because God knew what was going to happen, is God the cause of what happened? Did God cause the nation to go into slavery? And the answer to that is no. He used the sinfulness of the Egyptian people and the Egyptian Pharaoh, the sinful uh, virus that lives in us, that, that wanted to hate and wanted to kill and wanted to destroy. God used that for his will, and he accomplished his will. He uses good things and bad things. We talked about that last week, to accomplish his purpose and his plan. So here we are. We're in Egypt, they're slaves, the times are incredibly difficult, but God's going to use these situations and circumstances to reveal several things to us that are critical for you to understand the story. So here's your first blank if you're following along um, and would like to take notes. The first thing God reveals to us here is he reveals his name. God calls a man named Moses to free his people from slavery in Egypt. Moses was actually a Hebrew boy that when those killing squads that had been sent out from Pharaoh were hunting the newborn baby Hebrew Israelite boys, Moses' family did something that risked all of their lives. Moses' family hid baby Moses for three months. Can you imagine having a newborn baby and for three months having to keep him quiet and hidden from killing squads? Well, then at three months, they decide we can't do this anymore. So they come up with an unthinkable plan. They place their newborn three-month-old baby in a basket and send him down the Nile River. Can you imagine as a mother placing your baby in a basket and sending him down the river? But it was the only hope. 
to see Moses survive. It was their only plan of hope. Well, that boy, Moses, gets found by a princess bathing in the Nile River, a daughter of Pharaoh himself. And that daughter ends up raising that baby in the palace. And that baby gets schooled and taught and trained. And one day he sees other people mistreating some of his fellow countrymen. He sees a slave handler abusing one of his fellow countrymen and a rage envelops over him and he strikes him and kills the man who is, who is uh, abusing his fellow countrymen. Well, Pharaoh gets wind of this and Pharaoh says, Moses has got to die. So Moses flees into exile, into the desert where he lives for 40 years as a shepherd. 40 years living in the desert as a shepherd. 40 years, one day, he's watching his sheep like he always does. He's on the mountain, and he sees something very strange. He sees a bush on fire, but this isn't a normal bush. This bush is burning, but it's not burning. There's fire, but the bush itself isn't burning up. And then something even stranger happens. The bush talks, and the voice of God speaks to Moses. And as this voice speaks... God tells Moses of his plan for Moses to return to Egypt and lead God's people out of their time period of slavery. And Moses has got some questions. Would you have any questions? Moses has got some questions. One is a question that hasn't been asked yet in the story. Moses says in Exodus 3, 13 and 14, Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, well, what's his name? What should I tell him? So God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God reveals his name for the very first time in the story, his personal name. I am who I am. The Israelites up to this point have referred to God as Elohim or El for short, E-L. You see that abbreviation all over scripture. And they had other names attached to that, like El Roy, which is the God who sees, or El Shaddai, God Almighty. But El was kind of the generic term for God. Now, of course, that's uppercase G in the Bible, not the lowercase G God. But El would be the term like we would use for God, but it wasn't his personal name. God here reveals his name to him. He says, I am that I am. That is translated as Yahweh. Yahweh. It means the self-existent one. And it conveys that God is the ruler and authority and source and dominion of all things. That he is, that he was, and that he will be. That he's completely and fully self-sufficient. So God reveals to his nation, for the first time, his name. And the next thing he reveals, number two, is he reveals his power. He reveals his power in an incredible way, in the ten plagues that he sends upon the Egyptians. Moses goes back, as he was commanded by God, and he stands before Pharaoh, and he gives him the, hey, you got to let... Um, God's people go, and Pharaoh's not having any of it. And if you remember the story, God also gave Moses the staff, and he throws it down. It becomes a snake, and the magicians come, and they do a trick too, and then God's snake eats there. I mean, it's an amazing story. Go back and read it in your Bibles or in the story if you haven't yet. But these amazing things are taking place, but that's not where God's going to really demonstrate his power in a big way. And I want to show you that the plagues were intended. This is the reason God is doing these things. And we find that at the first plague in Exodus 7, 17 through 18. This is what it says. This is what the Lord says. By this, you will know that I am the Lord. That's how this begins. By this, you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. And this is exactly what happens. By this you will know, I am the Lord. Now let me just tell you something. In Moses' time, there was no such thing as an atheist. Okay, People believed in either God, lowercase g, or gods, the pantheon of gods. 
There was never a question on whether or not there was a God. The question was, who is the most powerful God? And that is going to come up over and over throughout the story. The ancient people wanting to know, not if there's a God, but who uh, is the most powerful of the gods. And here God is going to really reveal that in a profound way. He's going to send the plagues. First, he sends Moses to tell him, let God's people go. He says, no, so the rivers turn to blood. Then the frogs come. Then he sends them again, and the lice or the gnats come. Then he sends them again, and the flies come. Then he sends them again, and the livestock is struck down. Then he sends them again, and they get boils on their bodies. Then he sends them again, and a hail storm destroys the crops. Then he sends them again, and the locusts eat up what's left. And then he sends them again, and darkness falls in the middle of the day. Now, the tenth plague is yet to come. And in the tenth plague, God's going to reveal not only his power, but he's going to reveal his plan. So number three that you can write down is God is going to reveal his plan. That tenth and final plague is both devastating and revealing. God tells Moses that at midnight tonight, an angel is going to come and sweep through the entire kingdom of Egypt, and it's going to take the life of every firstborn male. However, the angel will pass over your home if you mark your doorway with the blood of an unblemished lamb. Exodus 12, verse 12 through 13. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on those houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you When I strike Egypt. See, God actually gave them, we don't have friends, you understand that we're covering a lot of stuff here. And we could do a whole year sermon series just on the signs and symbols provided to God's people on that first night of Passover. There's so many different things. God told them what to eat, how to prepare it, what to wear while they ate it. He gave them descriptions about every single aspect of that evening. But the thing we're focusing on right now, the thing that we really need to see, because it's going to come into the story so many different times, that in this plague, it's going to require, for the first time, we're going to see this, the shedding of the a spotless lamb's blood. And God is going to reveal, through this act, a central clue that's going to play out in the rest of the story. For judgment to pass over humanity, it's going to require the shedding of a lamb's blood. It's not going to be our blood. It's not going to be our blood that keeps us safe from judgment. It wasn't the Hebrews' blood that kept them safe from judgment. It wasn't the fact that they were Israelites that kept them safe on that night. It was the fact that their doors had been marked with the blood of the lamb. And the blood of the lamb would lead to their salvation. So can you see, friends, where this is going? Remember, what holidays were people in Jerusalem celebrating on the night that they hung Jesus on the cross? Oh, Passover. Right. Okay, so all of this is happening, just as God said it would happen. The tenth plague is carried out, and Exodus 12, 31 through 33 comes and says, During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people. You and the Israelites, go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said and go and also bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country for otherwise they said, we all will die. The new nation, the Israelites, the Hebrew people, leave Egypt with this undeniable demonstration of God's power through the plagues. And then they come to the Red Sea. And as they stand on the edge of the Red Sea, Pharaoh, it says, has a change of heart, changes his mind, and he sends his chariots and his army in pursuit of this nation who's now stuck against an immovable object, a barrier that there's no hope for rescue. The army is ready. They've moved to the back of the nation. They're ready to fight. But before they're allowed to fight, the pillar of fire that's leading them, God's presence itself, moves and stands between Pharaoh's army and God's army. 
He doesn't allow a conflict to take place. This is a good story. They should make a movie out of it. Maybe Charlton Heston or something. You know. The nation is now separate. And they're g- complaining. You're going to see this playing out over and over again. Here's one of the first times we see it. They're saying, weren't there enough graves in Egypt? You let us out here just to kill us? You let us out here just to be buried in the ground next to the Red Sea? We at least had beds in Egypt. Why would you do this terrible thing to us? And Moses says, stand back, because God is going to fight for us. And you will see the power of God displayed. He stretches his staff out, and the Red Sea opens up, and the nation walks across it on dry ground. They get to the other side, and the pillar of fire lifts, and the chariots begin to pursue across the Red Sea, only for God to close it up and swallow all of Pharaoh's army right in front of his people. God is now going to lead his new nation into the promised land. It has been 645 years since God promised Abraham the land. And now his descendants are following a pillar of fire through the desert, headed towards the promised land. God's going to provide for all of their needs. Literal food is going to fall from the sky every single day for them to eat. Their shoes don't wear out. Their clothes don't wear out. Everything that they need is provided for them. So you'd think things are going to go great this time. But they don't. That grumbling that I told you about continues. It gets worse and worse. They don't like the root. They don't like the food. They don't like the water. They just wish they'd never left Egypt. And now as they head through the desert, headed toward the promised land of Canaan, three months into their journey, they come to a mountain, Mount Sinai, the place that God has led them where God is going to meet with them in an unbelievably powerful way. So now as a gathered nation, they stand at the base of the mountain, and you'll hear this text in Exodus 19. Verse 16 through 20. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, and everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up. There's some important things we need to see that are happening here. Remember at the very beginning, if you weren't here, I'm going to catch you up. In the very beginning in the garden, we said the reason God had made all of this, all of us, was that he wanted a family. He wanted a people. He wanted to live with amongst his family, his people. And now, because of sin, because of the virus living in us, God still desires this thing to live his people to live amongst us but because of sin there's going to be some changes made things aren't going to be like they were originally in the garden but god has brought his family to this mountain for our second or third or what are we at like hundredth chance so far in the story to regain god's dream for our lives so god says i want to live amongst you i want to dwell amongst you i want to be your god and you be my family but We first have to figure out how we're going to make this relationship work. So on the mountain, God reveals to us several things that are going to be necessary for him to live in the midst of and dwell amongst his people. Here's the first one in this section. Number one in this is there's got to be guidelines and how we and how they relate to each other. This is a section of scripture that you're probably familiar with. It's foundational in not only Western culture, but world history. It's called the Ten Commandments. 
Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above or on the earth, beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day it is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your sons or daughters, nor your male or female servants, nor your animals, nor any foreign ret residing in your towns, for it in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that was in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land. That you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So God provides for his people his ten commandments. And I love that in the New Testament, Jesus actually gives us commentary to help us understand what this is all about. Jesus is asked a question by this expert in the law to, to summarize or to tell us what's the most important part of the law. And Jesus says in Mark 12, 30 through 31, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. See, what Jesus is saying is the Ten Commandments and the 600 other plus commandments that are yet to come, to understand them, they're basically divided into two categories. One, how we relate to God, and second, how we relate to other people. The Ten Commandments, the first four deal with our relationship between us and God, and after that, the next ones come about our relationship with our neighbors, with each other. So God gives us these guidelines. This is how we need to treat each other. This is how we need to act. And importantly, that we can't have other gods, other idols, that we need to keep him as our central focus of our life and of our faith. The second thing God tells us on the mountain is he's going to need a place to stay. Exodus 25, verse 8 through 9. Have them, then have them a sanctuary, then have them a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all of its furnishings exactly like the pattern that I will show you. So God gives Moses these very specific, again, whole sermon series here. He gives them an exact precision instructions about how to make each detail, the furniture, how to make the stand, how to make the altar, the Ark of the Covenant's plans, the tent walls, the fabric, the material, the size, the length, the shape. All of it God spells out in detail. And you may wonder, why, God, are you doing that? Well, actually, because his son, Jesus, in 1,400 years, is going to reveal to us the culmination of all of these things. God's presence is going to come down and actually dwell in this tent, live in this tent, right in the middle of Israel's camp. And in the back of the tent, there's a set-apart area known as the Holy of Holies. This is going to be uh, duplicated when the temple is built. In many years, we'll get there in the story. But here we have this area of the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. In that place, the Ark of the Covenant, which contains the, the law that God has just given to Moses, in that place, there'll be what's called the mercy seat, the place where one time a year, the high priest is going to come in and lay the offering on the seat of mercy for the forgiveness of sins of the, the nation of Israel once a year. That's the only time that they were given that they could go there. So God says, I'm going to come and I'm going to dwell with you. I need this place set up for me to dwell. Again, when we get to Jesus, you're going to understand why. And he tells him this important thing because these two go hand in hand. 
Number three is he says sin has got to be atoned for. Sin is going to have to be atoned for. This is the section of Scripture where your book of Leviticus lies. The book of Leviticus, which can seem so hard to read, so odd and so challenging. But the book of Leviticus is once again God in detail spelling out exactly how to carry out this new system of sacrifice, this new system where the atonement of sin was going to take place. In it, you have purity laws and cleanliness laws and sacrifice laws and all of these details given to the Levites, the priestly class, on how to carry out these sacrifices. Again, if you want to see why, we're going to look at that in Jesus' life 1,400 years from now because he's going to fulfill all of this book of Levitical laws. In order for mankind to be in relationship with God, and to live in community with God, these three things are going to have to happen. There's going to have to be a law, guidelines, a covenant between mankind and God. God's going to have his dwelling place, the tabernacle, and the institution known as sacrifice is going to begin. Now, there were sacrifice in the Bible prior to this moment, but never anything like this. If you look at the sacrifices that took place prior to this being spelled out, it's, it's completely different in how they did it and what they did and who did it and how it's offered and where it's offered. So this is a unique new set of instruction. we got to always remember this important fact. If sin could be atoned for by the shedding of a lamb or a ram or a bull's blood, why was God quarantining himself into the back of a tent where nobody could go except the high priest one time a year. If sin could be paid for by rams or bulls or, or the birds in some cases or sheep, why was God separate from people? Because you have to understand that these things were all a symbol of something that was yet to come. And we're going to see that clearly in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. It says this, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilty of their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sin. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. See, God was instituting a system that was symbolic to the nation of Israel, where they would remember their sin, where they would remember their faith, where they would repent of their sin and walk away from their sin. But the reality was the blood of these lambs or bulls or goats could never actually cover over their sin. Now, do you know the rest of the story? Moses is up on the mountain, and he's taking too long. He's been up there 40 days and 40 nights, and the people of Israel are down below in their camps, and they're getting nervous. They don't like how long Moses is taking. And so, I'll tell it to you from their perspective. They began to take off their jewelry, and they threw it into a furnace, and as Aaron said, out popped a golden calf. And they begin to worship that golden calf. They begin to attribute their success, their victory, their being set free from Egypt to a familiar Egyptian god. And once again, we're reminded in this story, just picture the camp is down at the base of the mountain. On the mountain is the smoke, the fire. They see it. They heard God call Moses up to the mountain. And they're like, he's taking too long. Let's worship a golden calf. Once again, we see no matter how many opportunities we're given for a fresh start, no matter how many chances at a new beginning we're given, the results are always the same. Get used to this theme, friends. We haven't even gotten to the book of Judges yet, where it's up and down and up over and over. Because this virus called sin that runs through our veins, it kills and it corrupts absolutely everything it touches. And after all of this, 
Moses returns down with this new covenant that's been offered to him by God. You know the story. He breaks it. He goes. He gets it again. God, in his mercy, not only is he not done with them yet, he's going to offer them once again. This time, they do make the right decision. They do say, okay, we agree to the terms of the covenant. The covenant is this. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. I'll bless you. I'll lead you if you follow my guidelines. If you go through the things that we just spoke about, the setting up of the tabernacle and the sacrificial system, then God will bless them and he will lead them. They leave this time at the mountain and we cross into the book of Numbers. And you think, okay, now they they probably have got it now, right? We probably are to the point in the story where they've said enough mistakes, let's get this right this time. So Moses gets his 12 best men, He sends them into the promised land. They're standing at the Jordan River. They're going to go and they're going to check it out for us. They're going to see what kind of land, the topography, what type of fruit grows there. If everything is in order and going to determine the plan so that we can begin to take this promised land. And the spies come back and 10 of them say, actually all 12 of them say, it's great land. It really is a land flowing with milk and honey. In fact, it tells a story about the grapes that are so big they have to carry them on a stick between two. This is awesome stuff. This is good land. But ten of them say, we can't do this. It's too hard. There are cities there with big walls and armies. And worse yet, there's giants in the land. This is going to be impossible. This is how bad things get, friends. Moses and Aaron are on their face in front of the nation, begging them, trust God, trust God. Caleb and Joshua, the two spies that returned from the land, that said, no, we can do this. God's with us. Trust God, trust God. The people of Israel have a meeting, and they pick up stones to kill their leaders so that they can return to Egypt. But God steps in and saves them. But because of this moment, The people of Israel, this entire generation, is going to die in the desert. Only their children and Joshua and Caleb are going to be allowed to enter the land of promise. Not even Moses. A man who spent more time face to face with God than anyone else. A man who experienced more of the miraculous power of God. Not even Moses would escape the realities of our sin virus. Moses, when God told him exactly what to do, disobeyed God. And Moses' lack of trust would result in not even Moses going into the promised land. Band, you can come back up. and We're going to continue in our worship here in just a moment. But friends, as we read through these stories, I'm just struck. I'm struck with this reality that no matter how hard we try in our own ability, in our own strength, by our own wisdom, by our own ways, in our own planning, we make a mess out of stuff. Anyone have a testimony to that? We make a mess out of stuff, friends. But what we are going to see repeatedly throughout this story is that God is merciful. God is kind and God is gracious. And even when we mess things up, even when we intentionally disobey, even when we go away from his desire for our lives, he's still there working all things together for the good for those who are in Christ Jesus and called according to his purposes. He's still there working out this plan to save us, to help us. He's still there doing his good, merciful, kind, loving work. So friends, here's my encouragement to you today. No matter where you're at, no matter what's happened, no matter how bad it may seem, no matter how lost you may feel, no matter how captive you may be by your circumstances or situation, we have a God who rescues us when we call out to him for help. We have a God who's powerful, who's able, who's strong, who's confident, and who's willing to help us to rescue us. So if you're here today and you feel stuck, you feel lost, you feel up against it and you can't see a way through, then come today to one of these crosses as we worship. Write down that issue and stick it to the cross. Leave it there, remembering that at the cross, Jesus was sacrificed so that once and for all, we could live in open and free relationship with the Father. If you're here today and you would like a reminder of that, then come and grab communion and take it back to your seat. 
hold in your hand the tangible reminder of what Jesus has done for you. If you're praying for a friend or a family member who is stuck, who is lost, who is in captivity, then pray for them and come and light a candle that represents that prayer. And as always, if you need prayer in the back and here in the front, we have people who would love to pray with you. So let's stand together. Let's call out and cry out to the living God who saves us, who rescues us, who has a good plan for us today.
Thank you, Lord. We give it to you, Lord. You're worthy of that, Lord. We do it in obedience, Lord, and out of love, Lord Jesus. We want to surrender all of our things. We want to surrender to you right now, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We listen to our hearts. Worthy 
that way too. Lord Jesus, you are our firm foundation, Lord. Help us to trust you in that. So for a benediction today, I want to read to you the very first one that comes out of this section of scripture that we've just covered today. Moses is giving the instructions to Aaron and to the priest and how to bless the people. He says, are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. May the Lord give you peace. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Read chapters 5 and 6 this week if you'd like to stay with us in the story.